Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session on disturbance impacts and responses. I'm Chris Goff, co-convener here uh, with Beth Newingham and David Reed and Alastair Smith. Should be here um, in a few moments, I think. So we'll, we'll go ahead and get uh, started here with a talk with uh, Scott Getz. And we'll have a couple of talks, and then we'll actually have about five minutes for questions. So think of some good questions to, to ask our first two speakers. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the invitation to be here today and speak in this session. Um, first off, I wanted to acknowledge my co-authors, especially Ben Bond Lamberty, who uh, uh, help put a lot of this work together that I'll be presenting today, but a whole lot of other people, including, I'll just run through them because I think it's important, Bev Law, Jeff Hickey, Chen Kuan Wang, uh, Ski Houghton, and for those of you who know Ski, congratulate him on being inducted as an AGU Fellow this year, uh, Steve McNulty, Tom O'Halloran, Mark Harmon, Arjun Meddens, Eric Pfeiffer, David Maldrexler, and uh, Eric Krasiski. Um, this, is, this talk is mostly based on a paper which appeared in the JGR Biogeosciences uh, a couple months ago, um, and it's part of a North America carbon program disturbance synthesis, so volume 117 of JGR Biogeosciences, a lot of good papers in there worth a look. Um, so just, in, just by way of context, uh, let me give you just brief background for why this topic is important. Uh, and that is because forests are a large source of carbon emissions um, during disturbance events, but then also very large carbon sinks post-disturbance. Uh, so I'll talk a good bit about that. And it's important to understand how they recover from disturbance and how that differs between fire insect, wind, um, uh, and other types of disturbance, including harvest, if we include that as a disturbance, and any combination of those. Um, and the magnitude and rate of the recovery depends on a quite complex series of interactions and feedback, so I'll touch a little bit about on that as well. Uh, and it varies not only through time, but across landscapes, so a lot of heterogeneity. So. Um, in the paper, we explored these topics in the context of uh, carbon recovery post-disturbance, mostly focused on forest. Uh, so the outline for my talk today is just, I'll go a little bit into conceptual models by way of background, and then run through some case study examples, uh, and then try to synthesize what we think are some salient points from, from this, um, this piece of work, and uh, even some research needs as we see them going forward. This is an uh, image based on MODIS time series imagery using uh, land surface temperature and vegetation index data um, produced by David Maldrexler, just showing the extent of disturbance across North America. And I'm sure as many of you know, it is quite extensive, um, ranging from wildfire and insect disturbance in Alaska, um, insects, fire, and harvest in the Pacific Northwest, uh, all the way across cent central Canada um, and southeastern U.S., which is heavily uh, dominated by harvest. Um, so I'll run through some of these as case studies, but this image will appear again just by way of uh, reminding us where we are. So in terms of conceptual models, these this sort of classic model of recovery post-disturbance has been around for quite some time uh, based on Odom's, Eugene Odom's work. Um, so net ecosystem production being a combination of net primary production, less uh, microbial respiration, heterotrophic respiration, um, and then just across the, the x-axis there, time since disturbance. So this is sort of the classical idea of disturbance and post post uh, disturbance recovery. But of course, that varies tremendously. And uh, so we can run through a couple examples here of how, for example, whole stand harvest in a warm climate might look um, first, where we're looking at, um, on the top, net ecosystem production, and on the bottom, heterotrophic respiration, um, where you see, in a warm climate, some essentially a decline in the years post-disturbance. This 
can't get any light out of this thing. Um, and then the inset there is showing gross primary production, that's the dashed line, and autotrophic respiration just by way of reference. So if we compare that to say something like whole stand harvest in a cool climate, um, it might look something like this conceptual model on top. Yeah, I'm not getting anything. Looks like it's green. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it might be quite different in a cool climate because of the pulse in the heterotrophic component is delayed. Um, and that graph on the bottom there also has um, an inset showing, um, showing a legacy pool of carbon and, um, and regrowing forest. So that's what those insets are there. And then maybe something quite different such as fire disturbance where a stand killing fire disturbance where you'll see this much later pulse in, uh, in microbial respiration, say 30 years out from, for example, stems that are killed but don't fall until, until 20 some years later, which is actually quite common, for example, in a boreal system. So you'll get then a big pulse of microbial respiration that occurs later. So this is, this is work um, based a lot on, for example, uh, uh, Mark Harmon's, Harmon's work in this field. Okay, so let's walk through some case studies and just see how much these actually vary um, geographically. Thank you. Um, so let's look at the southeastern U.S. here, and um, this is an area that's been quite heavily studied, and a number of papers using Landsat time series imagery um, to look at how um, changes are taking place in this region, and, and the changes are actually quite tremendous. The first time I saw them, I wasn't sure that it was correct, but in fact, the, the disturbance rotation in the harvest rotation in this area is just really tremendous. And so these are just Landsat scenes going from 1988 to 2008, giving you an idea of how the colors change for each year, and this is, this is how that looks across the landscape. So just really quite wall-to-wall -wall tremendous change in, in this region. Uh, publication by uh, Chen Kuan Wang and Sam Goward and, and a series of others on this topic. Oops. Uh, and then this is showing some statistics for that, that kind of landscape change, looking at harvest rotation. Um, so on the right, stand age running out to something like 50, 60 years and then just a frequency distribution of that. And what you see is that the landscape is heavily skewed towards stands that are 30 years or younger age. And then on the left is height growth, and almost all that height growth, or the rapid rise in height growth is, a chain, is occurring in the first 20 years. Um, so these areas, this is where all the productivity and biomass and carbon is being accumulated, and then they get harvested and cycle. Um, so again, very rapid rotation. Um, thought I had another slide in there. Guess not. Um, okay, let's now jump to the Pacific Northwest. Um, quite a different system, um, where we look at maybe another frequency distribution, looking at age classes. Of course, in the Pacific Northwest, much bigger, longer-lived trees. Harvest rotation is much um, uh, slower. So you see this age classes that are maybe running out to 45, 50 years, beyond, out to 100 years, uh, and beyond. Um, so quite different than the southeastern U.S., but also very, still very heavily dominated in terms of carbon budgets by harvest. Um, and also quite different in terms of public versus private lands, um, with, um, as you can see here, this skewed towards the lower end on the, on the private and, and public lands um, relative to one another. And if we look at that in terms of net ecosystem carbon balance, um, this is from Dave Turner's work published uh, last year, um, we see that this harvest rotation is heavily dominated by, again by, um, or this net ecosystem carbon balance is heavily dominated by the harvest um, rotation. So net ecosystem carbon balance here is net ecosystem production, which of course is the difference between NPP and heterotrophic respiration, less this harvest removals, less fire emissions. And what we also see there is this shift from a net source in terms of net ecosystem carbon balance to quite a large net sink on public lands and something near a, maybe a small sink on uh, private lands uh, in this part of the world. Um, and that is partly or heavily related to the implementation in the 
early 90s of the Northwest Forest Plan, in which many of you may remember all the uh, debate about harvest uh, in the Pacific Northwest at that time and spotted owl and so on. So that was implemented and it did in fact have quite a large impact uh, in terms of how these forests are managed uh, and how the net ecosystem carbon balance has switched from a net source uh, to a sink, but quite variable between public and private. The other significant disturbance component in this part of the world is our insects. Um, this is a map that was put together by Garrett Meggs, uh, Oregon, Washington here, the Cascades, um, and showing the distribution uh, accumulated through time of disturbance from mountain pine beetle, which, is, which invades stems and results often in mortality of trees, versus the western spruce budworm, which is shown in blue, which is more of a, is a defoliator and won't necessarily kill the trees except for a repeated infestation. So it depends on, on the intensity of the infestation, whether that results in mortality or not. But you can see that they're quite different, the way they're distributed across the landscape with pine beetle kill down here and way up here in the northern Cascades and then a lot of this spruce budworm um, in the central part of the state. So quite different. And then there's a lot of interest in how insect kill, mortality, or defoliation might relate to fire disturbance. And that story is not quite as clear as we might think. Uh, you'd think that mortality killed stands would be more prone to fire disturbance, but it turns out that that's, that's a complicated story. Um, and it doesn't seem to actually line up here uh, as well as you might expect. Um, all the yellow areas there being um, fire disturbance um, over the 1984 to 2008 time period. So they don't line up geographically as well as you might, as you might think. And that's probably because when conditions are right, hot and dry, these forests will burn whether they are dead or not. In fact, there's some evidence that crown fires were ca will carry even better in a, in a live uh, forest canopy. So, okay, next case study is in the boreal forest ecosystem. This is something I know a little bit about. Uh, I've worked in these, this part of the world for a while now. Um, and part of the work that we've done there has shown um, a pretty clear link between uh, burn severity and um, post-fire recovery of forests. Um, where in this part of the world, the soils, the organic soils actually burn um, so you'll see that you get some composition of the organic uh, soil layer down to something close to, to uh, a mineral soil. And that has big implications for what happens post-fire, what comes back. Um, if it's a less severe fire, um, say something on the order organic layer of about 10 centimeters, you might see the system coming back to what it was before a conifer dominated, say, a black spruce forest in North America and Alaska. Um, if it's organic layers of something on the order of five centimeters, you might see a mixed stand, some deciduous and conifer mix. If it's burned most of the organic soil off to close, something close to mineral soil, you see this very strong deciduous cohort, um, um, and it persists for quite some time. Uh, into the future. So there's a lot of work on this, a number of publications listed here, uh, Jill Johnson, Eric Kosicki, Mara Tureski, um, a whole series of papers um, on this effect and it's pretty, pretty well documented. So this is, burn severity is, is quite a critical factor in what happens in boreal systems post-fire. We've uh, done a little bit of work too, mapping this deciduous evergreen component using MODIS time series data. So this is a paper we had out uh, in 2011, Global Change Biology, just showing the deciduous evergreen component of the Alaskan landscape. For those of you who don't know Alaska, here's the Brooks Range, Alaska Range down here. This is the interior, which is heavily boreal forest uh, dominated. Um, and you'll see in the upper right that what's deciduous, meaning it's a brighter green color, is often well aligned with these fire, fire scars, uh, particularly in the more severely disturbed, uh, more severe burning. Um, and you can look at that again statistically, looking at years since fire and how the deciduous component um, 
dominates in high severe burns versus lower severity burns. Uh, and that's documented here it just using the modus imagery and, and looking at time sense fire using, doing a space for time trade-off here where we're using the year burned uh, and the deciduous component of the current uh, time period based on modus. And that uh, also translates, of course, into biomass. Higher deciduousness, faster productivity, higher productivity, and higher biomass in these uh, deciduous stands. So that shows up again pretty clearly as you look at the distinction between high severity burns um, with this deciduous component that increases through time going out to 40, 50 years post-fire with a persistent deciduous cover as a proportion of total biomass in the solid line there. Low severity burns, you might see some initial deciduous component in the early years post-fire, but then that declines pretty rapidly as the conifer component comes back. So we've seen this in field studies. We see it in satellite imagery uh, looking through time. Okay, next case study is in the western mountains in the, in the interior U.S., central, uh, central Rockies. Um, and this one was mostly focused on insect outbreaks. Um, this is a graphic that um, Jeff Hickey and colleagues had put together, published earlier this year in Global Change Biology, um, looking at the myriad influences on post-disturbance uh, carbon cycling resulting from insect infestations. Um, and we can run through these. I don't know how well you can see them, but the type of disturbance Agent is important as we look at a um, at a um, growth. What is this? This is a defoliator on the left, and this is a um, a beetle kill on the right here. Yeah, a bark beetle on the right. So basically, what well you may not be able to see, but this there's a um, there are still leaves on these trees. They're very bright red. These trees are all defoliated and dead, killed by a bark beetle versus a defoliator. So it's quite similar to the situation we saw in the Pacific Northwest. Um, yeah, another factor in terms of what influences carbon cycling post-disturbance in this part of the world is the intensity of disturbance. So the number of trees killed in the study area shown in the upper right there, looking at um, something like a partial mortality here, still a bunch of green trees versus a really intense uh, mortality here. In the lower right then, we can, we can take that a bit further and look at the numbers and size of surviving trees and maybe even an understory component that comes in depending on different intensity of disturbance. And then finally in the lower left here, there's a, a time sense disturbance element where you have something immediately following attack versus something that's decades later. And you'll see in this example a lot of dead wood on the forest floor as it, um, over time, these stems fall and you get this big, again, this big pulse that comes um, from the respiratory component um, years after the, uh, the event takes place. So insect disturbance, quite complex and depends a lot on the intensity of the disturbance again. So in terms of some take-home points um, from this run through case studies, we can think about some of the critical gaps in our understanding and the need for measurements that are specific to specific disturb disturbance types. Um, so differences in processes involved and knowledge gaps is what we're after here. Um, and I don't know how well you can see this, but we've got a table, it's in the paper, um, where we identified type of disturbance, whether it's wildfire, harvest, insects, storms, or any of those, um, some critical gaps in our understanding, and then some thoughts on approaches or measurements that would be most beneficial for addressing these critical gaps. So just briefly uh, point out wildfire, um, burn severity, which I already talked about, the case especially in boreal systems, uh, use of remote sensing uh, approaches there. Seasonal dynamics, which we saw in terms of the deciduous evergreen component in Alaska, need for long-term studies um, so that you can actually pick up the succession, the progression of succession. 
Uh, harvest, the fate of wood products is an important um, component we need to think about, and that can be um, got at using life cycle analyses, resilience of forest stands, um, study different levels of, of disturbance or mortality, and so on. So I won't run through all of these, but it gives you some idea of some of the salient points that we put together there. Another uh, synthesis item was getting at the uncertainty and variability, and we can express that in, in, in these conceptual models, perhaps in a little more sophisticated way, um, where we look at, we know that disturbance severity has pretty strong nonlinear effects, and there's also large scale versus long term disturbance. So um, this is the last slide. Um, just where we can start to think about making these conceptual models um, for different types of disturbance, whether it's fire or insects, more realistically represent what we might expect in terms of post-disturbance net ecosystem um, production and incorporating things like uh, secondary um, effects with wood decay. And, and there's another way to look at it here where we're looking at increasing disturbance intensity and these nonlinear effects where you might have a one-time event or you might have multiple disturbance events. And, you, and you'd see this recovery um, be quite different whether it's a fire disturbance and then a second fire disturbance or whether it's a logging, a harvest event or whether it's an insect event, again, with uh, multiple disturbances through time. So it just provides a framework for thinking about these conceptual models in perhaps a little more sophisticated way. Thanks for your attention. We'll have time for some questions here in just a moment, but we'll go ahead and move on to our second speaker, who is uh, David Mackay, who will be talking about plant hydraulic controls over ecosystem responses to climate-enhanced disturbances. Good afternoon. I want to thank the uh, conveners for inviting me and for putting this session together. Um, one of the common themes that we find with many disturbances to forests is the uh, effect on water, both in terms of supply of water and the de demand for water. And so one of the, the basic common theme in, in my talk is going to be focusing on plant hydraulic controls and how they uh, mediate uh, the responses to various types of disturbance. I want to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, Brent Ewers, uh, David Reed, uh, Elise Pendle from uh, the University of Wyoming, and uh, Nate McDowell from Los Al uh, Alamos National Labs. Uh, one of the things that we, we obviously see with, with uh, climate-enhanced disturbances is the uh, various uh, responses, whether it has to do with the water itself, uh, whether it's a biophysical response uh, in terms of the biochemistry of the, of the uh, canopy or whether it's a biogeochemical signal associated with, for example, uh, nutrient transfers, uh, that we, we see these different kinds of responses. Uh, but one of the things that we can argue is that, at least through the plant, there's a unifying uh, theme here, and that is that because plant hydraulics affects uh, stoma the, the stomatal conductance, which of course con controls the behavior of the canopy, uh, that we, by implication, can say that carbon intake, uh, carbon allocation and nutrient uptake, these things are going to be influenced by plant hydraulic conductance, and therefore having a good control over that component is going to be uh, essential to understanding how forests will respond to uh, uh, climate-enhanced disturbances. Uh, so uh, one example is, of course, the, the hypothesis that uh, with increased uh, nitrogen fertilization uh, following bark beetle, because when the needles are dying in a bark beetle infestation, they can't re retract the, uh, or retranslocate the nitrogen, and therefore there's an enrichment to the uh, nitrogen cycling in the, in the soil system. And therefore, the successional effect of that is uh, increased vulnerability to cavitation when there is drought conditions, when there, are, when there are some drought conditions. When it's well watered, we expect high productivity. 
Uh, so we're going to look at a, a few systems here. Uh, one is, let's see, here we go. Uh, in this system over here, we're looking at a, a cedar swamp in northern Wisconsin. And in this site, uh, what's happened is that the water table has dropped. And its normal condition is that you would have standing water on the surface. And the water table has dropped. The, shallow, the very shallow roots are highly susceptible to, to cavitation. Uh, over here, we have uh, a pinyon juniper site. This is the Sevieta experiment, uh, where they're, they're, they're exposing um, uh, pine and juniper to uh, a drought experiment. So they're exposing it to lower, low soil, soil water content. And then the third example I'm going to give is, is this uh, bark beetle uh, epidemic. Uh, in this case, it's a chimney park in uh, Wyoming. Um, and the model I'm going to use to uh, sort of centralize all of this is uh, the model we've been building over a number of years, the trees model. Uh, it, it's an integrated model that can look at stand uh, or larger scales, um, but it can also zoom in and look at plants. Uh, we can define uh, a groundwater table as a lower boundary. Uh, this is a dynamic boundary, so we can have water table rising and falling through the system. And uh, then we have soil water uptake by plants, uh, hydraulic redistribution, which I'll talk about very briefly in a second, and then uh, integrated uh, carbon, water, and nitrogen uh, within the canopy. Uh, and I want to focus in on this portion of the model, uh, which is a relatively new part that we've added, and one is that it, we've added uh, more sophisticated plant hydraulics, and uh, this is using uh, the Sperry model, uh, which I'll mention in a minute. And then non-structural carbon is something that's tied to um, both the carbon uptake through photosynthesis and the carbon uh, transport to sites where respiration needs to take place. And then nitrogen dynamics are affected also by hydraulic conductance, and that has an immediate impact on quantum yield um, if it's a steady state mode where the plant is constantly having to replenish the nitrogen f the, through the, the soil, the plant system, or whether there's a nitrogen stored in the, in the canopy, in this case, it can uh, survive a little bit longer. Uh, so the basic framework uh, works off the idea that transpiration is a function of hydraulic conductance and the gradient of soil water potential between the soil and the leaf based on Darcy's law. We can also describe transpiration in terms of fixed law of diffusion, in terms of the stomatal conductance times the vapor, vapor pressure deficit D. Uh, we can combine these, of course, and, and, and get a combined equation describing the, the stomatal conductance of the canopy as a function of whole plant hydraulic conductance of, uh, per unit leaf area, vapor pressure deficit, and the gradient of water potential between the soil and the leaf. So the idea is that we want to be able to solve for um, the, the, the psi leaf and the K in order to be able to get uh, a, an accurate uh, estimate of GS. Uh, we can also describe, of course, photosynthesis in terms of fixed law of diffusion and uh, plugging in your favorite photosynthesis model. In our case, we're using a Farquhar-based model. Uh, we can combine all of these things uh, to get a integrated uh, model that takes into account uh, carbon flow uh, limitations either through through light, the quantum yield, uh, through uh, rubisco activity, through the carboxylation, um, and takes into account the hydraulics. So the idea is to build a model then that couples all of these things together, and this is what we've done here, is we built a model that solves for the whole plant hydraulic conductance uh, using uh, um, uh, basically a model that was, de was devised by John Sperry in the late 90s. Uh, the, the unique characteristics of this model are that it allows us to use uh, vulnerability, the cavitation data that's collected at the, at the root level or at the stem level, and it allows us to uh, also look at dynamic uh, hydraulic conductance of the plant uh, 
including cavitation, and it remembers uh, the cavitation status of the plant as it progresses through a series of droughts. And what we've done is couple this with our canopy model, so we have photosynthesis, metal conductance, transpiration, all coupled in with the, the, with the hydraulics of the plant. Uh, we've added to this uh, the ability to store uh, non-structural carbon so that we can, we can go through these cycles of, of high when there is high demand but low intake, we can have uh, withdrawing of, of carbohydrates from uh, the stored pool and then augment, augmentation of that stored pool when we have uh, a surplus of, of incoming uh, photosynthetic uh, carbon. Um, and then the nitrogen uh, uptake is also affected by the hydraulic conductance, so we, we can then control the, the flow of nitrogen to the canopy. And then a, th a final thing that we've added to this to handle the, the effect of uh, bark beetles is to, is to incorporate the growth and spread of uh, blue stain fungi within the xylem. And this has the effect of lowering the hydraulic conductance of the plant even when it's well watered. So even, if, even under saturated soils, we'll see a decline in hydraulic conductance in the plant. And this is actually being modified through a temperature of the, of the bowl of the, of the tree. Uh, so our first uh, case study here is, this is in northern Wisconsin. We have a water table drop. The effect of the water table drop is to see um, a decline in transpiration. This is something that we published a few years ago in, in tree physiology. Uh, but we wanted to look at this in, again now that we have this model built and explain what's going on. And one of the things that, that's characteristic of a, a, uh, a, a species such as a cedar swamp um, is that we have very high vulnerability to cavitation. So this is the, the cavitation curve or a percent loss of conductivity curve that we would use. And you can see at 50% loss of conductivity, we have fairly modestly low water potential in the soil. Right, so what happens here is that a small amount of drying is going to lead to a very rapid decline in the hydraulic conductance of the plant. So we could say it's vulnerable to cavitation. And indeed, when we look at the model calibrated to the data, um, and the data is, uh, so on the, the left plot, the bottom, we're seeing, uh, what we're seeing there are observations given in open circles and the model fit in the blue. And the red line is the critical transpiration rate that's predicted by the model. This is the, the level of transpiration at which cavitation is taking place. So what you're seeing here is a very uh, low safety margin in, the, in these trees. And then the, the figure on the right is showing the full data set at half hour time steps, uh, showing the actual data and how it stacks up against uh, the predicted uh, critical transpiration rate. And you can see at several points in time it crosses over that line indicating that it's very, very close to cavitation at, most, at, at much, of its, much of its time period. Okay, uh, we will turn to the, the site in Sevilleta, uh, pinion pine and, and uh, juniper monosperma. Uh, this is an experimental setup. In this case we have two species that are less vulnerable to cavitation. Uh, one slightly more than the other. So we have the pinion pine with a 50% loss of conductivity at minus 2.7 and the juniper at minus 7.9. And so you can see the juniper obviously, obviously can go to very uh, low water potentials and still survive. But in this case, the, both droughted species experienced more, uh, mortality. Uh, the, the, the pinions completely and the juniper in, uh, in some individuals. And then if we look at then the response uh, of uh, basically two things here, uh, the blue line that shows there shows when the drought took place. So when the solid line turns into a dashed line, that's when the drought uh, was initiated. And what you're looking at on the top graph is uh, the percent loss of conductivity within the individuals. Uh, this, these are actually cohorts of, of several trees uh, for each uh, case. Uh, the the light-colored uh, individuals are the ones that experience the high drought, and you can see the very uh, high levels of, of percent loss of conductivity. And the graph on, on the right shows that there essentially is this bimodal distribution uh, for the most part 
uh, percent loss of conductivity. And these trees are, that are droughted are exposed to high PLCs uh, for a fairly significant amount of time, okay, right up to the point where they, where they die. Uh, and then the lower graph is showing non-structural carbon, and what you're seeing is, uh, the, is uh, seasonal cycles in the non-structural carbon as it's, it's rising when it's able to acquire lots of carbon and it's not utilizing this. This will be actually offset in terms of when you have summer periods and, and winter periods. Um, and one of the common things that we're seeing here is that as we go towards more drought stress, the amplitude of the non-structural carbon, uh, the ups and downs, are, are getting less and less. Okay, so it's, what's happening there is that it's not only not acquiring more non-structural carbon, it's not utilizing it because it can't transport it to where, it's, where, it need, where it needs it. In particular, it's not getting it to the roots. Okay, so the model is, what the model is predicting is not really the idea of carbon starvation. What it's predicting is this idea that carbon can't be used, okay, which is consistent with a lot of the studies that we, we saw uh, in, the, in a non-structural carbon session this morning, actually. Now, our third site is uh, the bark beetle site. And in, in this case, the, the, the problem in question here primarily is the, is the spread of blue stain fungi, which is a symbiont that comes with the, the bark beetle. The bark beetle, uh, in order to be able to grow, it uh, bore its way into the wood and not be excluded by, uh, by the tree itself, has the symbiont blue stain fungi, which actually shuts down at the, the defenses of the tree. And in the process, then, that blue stain is spreading throughout the, the hydroactive xylem of the tree. And over the course of about two months or so, it reduces the hydraulic conductance by almost its entire, uh, its entire range. And what we tend to find is that it starts sort of in the center of the, the hydroactive xylem. It spreads towards the cambium. And what you can see over on the left, on the very right side, are the uh, boreholes where, the, where, the, where the, the bark beetle has entered into this individual. Okay, and then the blue stain is shown in the center, uh, this coloration of the xylem. Okay, so we're going to simulate this because our hydraulic conductance is dynamic and it's going to respond to the presence of blue stain fungi. One of the things that we notice with the data is if you look on the the left, the photosynthesis data taken from uh, the site, but what we find is that there's very little, at least initial response in photosynthesis to the presence of uh, the blue stain fungi. And it's not until we get well into the decline in hydraulic conductance that we see a drop in stomatal conductance that is sufficient to cause a decline in photosynthesis. Okay, so we should be able to see that picked up by the model. And then on the right side, what we see um, is uh, some data. Both of these are actually reported in a poster by Brent Ewers uh, that's happening right now, uh, but don't run out. Um, he'll, he'll be there for quite a, quite a bit more time now, I think, for this afternoon. But one of the things we see is that when we expose these trees to either drought, uh, so drying in the soil, or bark beetle and a spread of uh, blue stain fungi, is that we see a decline in, uh, if we're just looking at the pine, um, we see this decline in the, um, the non-structural carbon that's left over in, in, in the plant. So the red column there shows uh, the drought condition uh, showing that there's a lack of, uh, there's a, a declining amount of non-structural carbon. So one of the things we should be able to pick up with the model is this kind of pattern. All right, so uh, what you're looking at here, the model is calibrated to uh, several scenarios. Uh, in one case, it's, it's calibrated to eddy covariance data. That's the top figure that's labeled plot. The middle figure play, uh, labeled live, the, this is calibrated to um, sap flux data on live trees, those ones that are, not, that are uninfected, so live refers to uninfected, and then green refers to trees that are infected, but their needles are still green. Okay, and it often takes about a year for them to go from, from fully green to fully red. 
So one of the things you find is if you look at the green line that's, that's superimposed on there, that's the, the critical transpiration rate. And we see that critical transpiration rate is, has declined in, uh, in particular in the green, right? So we see that decline of hydraulic conductance and, and it's manifested in a decline in the safety factor for the plant. And as you get out towards day 180 or so, it's crossing over the, the safety margin. And that means there's cavitation taking place. Uh, if we look at the live trees versus the, um, the infected trees, on the left side, the, the blue shows uh, the total time series at half hour time steps for one year, uh, showing the, the flux values. The dark is the observed, the, the lighter colored is the simulated, and then the upper curve, again, is the critical transpiration rate. And you can see the safety margin decline Towards the end of that time period, we're seeing a little bit of a drought as well. So superimposed on the effect of bark beetle is also a little bit of a drought. And then the lower figure shows the effect of, of having the bark beetle present, uh, and we have this decline in transpiration as, as associated with the decline in the hydroactive xylem. And then on the, on the right side, we sh we're showing net ecosystem exchange of carbon, and then the effect of, of the blue stain fungi on, on carbon uptake. All right, um, when we look at both non-structural carbon and percent loss of conductivity, one thing we find is that with the, the green trees, the infected trees, we see much higher percent losses of conductivity, and associated with that are declines. If you look at the green curves, you see declines in the amount of non-structural carbon towards the end of the year, particularly as we go through, through the drought, whereas the live trees are showing actually increasing uh, non-structural carbon. And that's consistent with what the data shows at this site and it's consistent with what's being shown in, in a number of other studies as well. The red curve shows the effect of, of adding nitrogen into the system and what that does for the trees. And the effect of that is to create, to make them more vulnerable to cavitation. We actually see a crossover uh, where their percent loss of conductivity goes higher um, even though their hydraulic conductance intrinsically is the same, okay? And then uh, the effect of not having enough nitrogen, the yellow line at the bottom on the, on the right shows the extreme example of not having enough nitrogen. Okay, so just wrapping up, uh, one of the things we find is that low uh, non-structural carbon is uh, alone not sufficient to explain the responses to disturbance even PLC, the, the hydraulic failure, is not, re, not responsible. We're not actually seeing full hydraulic failure. We still see some flux. Hydraulic impairment does uh, predispose these trees uh, to mortality by reducing carbon uptake. And uh, we, we can also show that it's, that it's declining in terms of stomatal uh, closure and there's low nitrogen uptake. Uh, the hydraulic impairment also has a negative effect on non-structural carbon transport and therefore respiration is shutting down. So it's a combined effect of both lack of uptake and lack of respiration and we're seeing a declining in change of non-structural carbon. And then finally the drying uh, shows similar hydraulic responses but distinct biochemical uh, responses. Thank you. Take one question. Um, the, so the answer to the, the first part, the model can do refilling of cavitated cells um, if you think your plants do that. So you essentially, you essentially define that based on the characteristics of your plant. So there are refilling functions or you can turn that off. Uh, we played around with also having that turn off when there's lack of, lack of non-structural carbon for rebuilding the cells.
So that, that's the first part. The second part is the model can run in a non-steady state form with capacitance. In this case, I did, I did run it without capacitance um, simply because uh, it, it's, it tends, well, first of all, it runs a lot faster, but that's, that's primarily the thing. All right, well, thank you, Scott and Scott, for, the, for giving those intro um, overviews. That was great. Um, we've, we're a, just a little bit behind schedule, so we'll, we'll have to hold, we'll actually have some extended time for questions a little bit later on because we have a withdrawn uh, talk. But we'll go ahead and move on to Amalinda Webb, who will be, uh, we'll cha change the topic just a little bit, talk about how community structure changes in response to disturbances. So when we look at the world today, there are a large variety of ecosystems with a lot of diversity within them. However, most of those ecosystems are being impacted by anthropogenic activity, whether it's oil spills, uh, fishing, clear cutting, or whatever. Biology has been increasingly focusing on this, and biological studies, by their very nature, are high resolution. They can sample every day or multiple times a day, but they have a limited time span. For example, some of the longest running biological studies are only 150 years long. That's pretty short when you think about the entire history of life on Earth. So science, uh, biology can both be experimental or observational, but it has limited variables. So it's only what's available today. In contrast, paleontology has a lot longer time record that we can play with. So of course, there's only observations. We can't go back in a time machine and run an experiment in, in the past. But there's a large diversity of events, much more than what we see in the modern. The problem is trying to get paleontologists and biologists to talk to each other. There's an issue of scale. How do you bridge that gap and get around the issue of time averaging? So what I'm doing today is looking at a variety of scales, starting with Oops, there we go. Starting with acid lakes in the modern, so a relatively short time scale, going up to diatoms and planktic foraminifera over interglacial cycles, and finally, at the highest scale, going up to a million year record of benthic foraminifera across the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. So I'd like you all to hang on to your seats because it's going to be a wild ride going from one to a million in less than 15 minutes. So the methods that I'm using today are focused mainly on looking at community structure. My favorite method is rank abundance curves. So it's a visualization of community structure and how that changes. This is a seminal study looking at plant communities, just to give you a feel for what a rank abundance curve does. So this study looked at an abandoned farmer's field from the first year after being plowed. So that's about as much of a disturbance as you can get for a plant community all the way through the next 40 years as the plant community repopulated and finally returned to a forest succession. So if we look at the rank abundance curves for this study, the first year you have a very convex down curve. So you're actually seeing just a few taxa doing really well and the few that are just barely hanging on. Whereas by year 40, you have a much flatter curve. It's much more even, a lot more stable. So the way that I'm measuring these curves is using kurtosis or the peakedness of the curve. So obviously, a relatively recently disturbed community is going to have high kurtosis, a very peaked distribution, as opposed to the blue curve, which is much flatter. It's much more of a lower kurtosis value. In addition, I'll be using evenness metrics and ordination, which is comparing community structure in ordination space, a visualization, visualization of the similarity. So starting at the lowest level, starting with the modern, acid lakes, looking at plankton communities, including diatoms and various zooplankton, over 150 lakes across both temporal and spatial or regional gradients. All of these are from the North America. And first, I want to draw your attention to the case study of Little Rock Lake. So this was experimentally acidified. You have the reference basin up in the top corner. 
which was basically separated from the rest of the lake by a plastic curtain. And as the experiment wore on, the scientists actually dumped sulfuric acid into the treatment lake, the experimental lake, to increase the acidity. And so you can see on the bottom graph how the treatment lake varies from the reference lake across the experimental interval. When we look at the community structure response to this, you can see the vertical lines are representing the pulses of acidification within the experimental basin. And you can really see that kurtosis varying a lot more and getting a lot higher, so much more uneven, much more dominated communities as you increase the acid stress. So moving from a temporal record to a spatial record, these are each one of these points is representing a lake across a region that had a lot of acidification for about the last 40 years. Some of the lakes remained neutral, some of them have recovered, and some are still acidic. And if you look at pH on the x-axis, you'll see there's a wide variety, but more importantly, I want you to look at the color differences. So if you see the green lakes that are neutral, you have relatively low kurtosis, so these are even communities. Whereas if you look at the recovered communities, you're increasing the range of a kurtosis and getting higher values. So you're increasing the unevenness of these communities. And finally, you see the highest variability and the highest values in the acidic lakes. So we're getting a good, strong tracking mechanism for both the disturbances and the stress of acid lakes. So when we expand this to the entire data set, over 150 lakes, both temporal and spatial records, again, you see at high pH values, neutral values, you have very low kurtosis, and it's really increasing as you go through the pH range into those lower, more acidic values. So that covers the modern scale. If we want to step back and look at bigger disturbances, we need to dive into deep time. To do this, I picked four separate studies. Of course, Little Rock Lake, which I've already shown you, and then going back to a 14,000-year record, Baron et al., who looked at diatoms across the Younger Dryas up to the present. And then Embry and Kip, who looked over 450,000 years, uh, looking at planktic foraminifera, multiple glacial interglacial cycles, and finally looking at Webb et al., benthic foraminifera across the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, and the response to that rapid global warming event. So starting with Little Rock Lake, we have two weeks between each sample. Barron et al. is about 200 years between each sample. Imbri and Kip has about 4,000 years between each sample. And on average for Webb et al., it's 20,000 years between each sample. So we're really increasing the amount of time in each of these studies. One of the problems that biologists have with paleontological data sets is the time averaging. So to test this, I'm actually applying artificial time averaging windows on top of the original data. It's basically to see how much time averaging do you have to induce artificially to lose the response that you're seeing in the raw data. Is there a point when there's too much time averaging and we can't tell anything from the fossil record? So again, going back to Little Rock Lake, because this is our best data set every two weeks, that's two generations between each sample in these systems, so that's a pretty good comparison to much longer records. So this is the same plot I showed you earlier, showing just the raw response of the community structure to the acidification. When, you apply, when I applied a moving average window of every three samples, you'll see that the absolute variation in kurtosis declined a little bit, but it's still picking up those very distinct increases during the increased acidification. If you increase the window further to every 11 samples, you see the pattern's just getting stronger. You're, increase, you're decreasing the variation, but you're still picking up those spikes of stress due to the acidification. Going up to 21, year, 21 samples, and finally 97 samples. So this is actually a smearing together of four years, and yet we're still picking up the overall trend of response to this disturbance event. So this just overlies all of them. I mentioned looking at discrete windows. So instead of just the overlapping moving window, as well as discrete. So you'll see the same, res same pattern depending on whatever method you're using for time averaging.
So switching to looking at evenness. Again, as acidification increases, you're seeing a decrease in evenness, which is what you'd expect. And when you apply the time averaging, you're still seeing that same trend. Although notice that the evenness values have actually been uh, pushed down, so you're actually getting more of a signal of being uneven, although the trend is the same. So the time averaging is actually messing with the evenness values a little bit and might be throwing off your interpretation. Overlooking all the different windows of time averaging, looking at discrete windows instead of the moving average where you have overlap, and then just to drive home the message, this is from the reference basin. So remember I said that there was the control as well as the experimental perturbation. In the reference basin, you'll see the very light line up at the top is actually the pH, and it's not varying throughout the ex experiment because nothing was done to it. You see the same pattern in kurtosis. Notice on the y-axis there's a much smaller amount of change, so it's only from 2 to 14, as opposed to, to 2 to 40 in the experimental basin. So there's no trend across the data set. And even when you apply a four-year moving window of time averaging, you're not destroying that pattern. Same with evenness. And I also want to look at ordination techniques, because that's another common way of looking at community structure. So this is the legend going from the bright reds all the way through to the cooler pinks across the rainbow spectrum, just to represent time in these samples. So if we look at the reference basin, remember no acidification there, you just see pretty much a shotgun blast. So there's no real pattern. In contrast, when you look at the treatment basin, you'll see that the reds and the pinks are actually overlying, and you have kind of an arch going from the original values through the disturbance, through the recovery communities, and coming back with a true recovery to communities that are almost the same as the original. And when you apply time averaging to this, you'll see it just clarifies the pattern. So it's a window of three, a window of 11, and a window of 51. So time averaging is removing a lot of that ecological noise and making it a lot clearer. So basically, this is good news. We can step up to longer time scales. Looking at the Baron et al. data set, so 14,000 years going from the Younger Dryas up through the, to the present. When we look at kurtosis values, again, so, We've actually switched, oh, there we go. This is the Younger Dryas at the very end, and you'll see that there's a slight shift in kurtosis values as you go from that uh, ice age into more normal events. And the time averaging is not destroying that signal. You get, again, evenness isn't picking up the disturbance quite as well, and the time averaging is actually shifting the values out of what you saw in the original data. Ordination, again, you're seeing a temporal signal from the warmer colors to the cooler colors. And when you increase the time averaging, it clarifies that pattern. So stepping it back even further, 450,000 year record. Uh, multiple glacial interglacial cycles. And when you look at the pattern, it's not quite as clear because you have so many disturbances and there's not quite enough fine enough window. So this is one of the issues with looking at the paleontological data. But again, time averaging isn't destroying any of the signal that is there. Again, evenness, not as sensitive to the changes across the time interval. And with the ordination technique, we're seeing a similar warm to cool pattern, which is clarified even more by the time averaging. So finally, getting up to our one million year record. So rapid global warming, looking at benthic foraminifera. If we look, going from before the event, uh, you have very low kurtosis values. And as you're coming through the event, you'll see the kurtosis values jump up. So those are the dominated, uneven communities responding to that rapid global warming. And the time averaging is not wiping out that signal. So even when we're looking at a time averaging window of over 100,000 years, it's not wiping out the overall signal. Similar story with evenness, and again with the ordination techniques. So thank you very much for listening. Just to sum up, disturbance is easily tracked across space and time. Even though we went from a one-year signal all the way up to 100 million years, we could still pick up the impacts of disturbance on a community structure. And the response and recovery is actually very similar even at these multiple scales.
So time averaging is actually a positive effect. It's removing some of that ecological noise and clarifying the, the ecological pattern. And paleoecology is offering a unique and robust perspective on looking at modern disturbances so that we can compare those to past disturbances and really start to make useful models for conservation. So thank you very much. So the, I was using a moving average um, with overlap for most of that because that's the worst case scenario because that would completely smooth out any differences from point events and it was a lot rougher than what you see with some of the more sophisticated mixing models and this was a brute force approach to see in the worst case can we still pick up these ecological signals. The best case is actually looking at the raw data, and you can still pick out the signals. They're just a little bit noisier. Okay. Well, thank you. We've got talk next from Marcos Longo on the impact of climate variability on forest dynamics in the eastern Amazon. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. So, uh, I would like to start by thanking all the co-authors for the collaboration in this study, as well as many other uh, people and institutions that contributed for this study. And as a brief motivation on, on this work, uh, I'm interested in the Amazon because it's the largest tropical rainforest in the world, and yet many studies have suggested that it could be uh, uh, heading towards some significant changes in uh, in the future due to drier and warmer climates. And in this most extreme example here in the Peter Cox simulation for uh, the Hadley Center, they showed that uh, the entire forest would be gone by the end of the 21st century. One year after this work came out, um, actually a very uh, widespread drought occurred in the basin, and especially in the southwestern part of the Amazon. Uh, and uh, Oliver Phillips and others Using site level measurements, uh, they compared the above ground biomass increments before and after the drought and noticed that many sites experienced redu reduction in uh, uh, biomass accumulation. Uh, the eastern part of the Amazon, which is going to be the focus of this talk, uh, did not experience that much of the drought during 2005 and again in 2010 when another drought happened. But some studies uh, in which they went to the uh, to the site, covered one uh, hectare of the forest with some plastic foil to prevent 50% of the, the rainfall to reach the ground. And they kept repeating this in Santarém, for example, for three years, and after three years, biomass uh, started to decline in the dry plot. So, uh, with this, I, my main interests are trying to understand how drought um, is effect, going to affect the forest dynamics in the Amazon. And first, I would like to see if there is any evidence of recent drought-induced mortality, because that would, could be used to uh, evaluate our model uh, ability. And also, trying to, to go beyond and try to see if we can uh, uh, predict some uh, significant collapse in the Amazon in the future. So when I'm talking about Eastern Amazon, I'm actually talking about two sites. And, Okay, I'm going to just point to the figure. So the GYF point is the Guia Felix Tower at Pahaku, a field station in French Guiana. And in the south, the S67 is the Tapajós National Forest in Santarém, Brazil. Both sites are, are, have very valuable data from Eddie Felix Towers and forest inventories. And they represent pretty much the extreme points in terms of total rainfall in the eastern part of the Amazon, with Pahaku being among the wettest and Santarém among the driest regions. And I'm going to use this data and run uh, the ecosystem demography model, which is a very uh, powerful tool to this, uh, this kind of analysis because it solves not only the ecosystem as a whole, but it also looks into the distribution 
uh, of properties in, in the biome. For example, we have the size structure. So we have trees with different heights, different rooting depths, and they are going to directly compete for light and soil moisture. Also, we have different successional types in the model. So early successional trees or uh, slow growers, late successional trees that are going to be fighting for the same resources. And age structure, so we, we have disturbance in the model, and this is going to create uh, heterogeneous profile, light profiles, for example, and uh, according to the age since the last time there was a disturbance. So, and the model also solves uh, biophysical processes to the, from the order of minutes and all the way to long-term dynamics to the order of centuries. So in the first round of simulations that I'm going to show here, uh, we started the model with the bio, uh, biomass distribution that is observed in the sites in Paracuin saint -Tanin. And we took the Ediflux towers and created meteorological drivers to run the model for a few years and see how they would compare uh, the mortality that was observed in the sites with the model evaluation. So this is the, the results that we got for saint and we obviously see here a significant bias in the uh, mortality in Ed2. Uh, but we know uh, the major contribution for that, and it's actually because in Ed we have two types of mortality. Uh, one which is the density de uh, independent, so that's pretty much aging effects and uh, tree fall, which is just assumed as a constant uh, at this current version. And the other thing is the negative carbon balance. And that's pretty much the only thing that varies over time in the model. And we see here, especially towards the end of the, the time series, that there is a good match between the observations and the, uh, and the model. And uh, this is mostly due to uh, two uh, localized droughts that occurred in Santa Rey in 2007 and 2009 that caused um, increased mortality, especially in the small trees in 2008 and 2010. That's also captured some to some extent in the observations. And at Pajacu, on the other, on the other hand, uh, the mortality has much more variation than what we actually simulate. Uh, again, with higher mortality than uh, the observations, but that, that's mostly due to uh, threefold disturbance events that occurred in the, in the area, especially in 2006, and that had, did not kill all the trees all of, uh, at once. Some of the trees were stayed kind of alive until 2008 and then died. And that contributed to some of the variability that's observed in the model. But we, because we assume the constant tree fall, we can't really solve this. So for the, the remaining of the talk, I'm going to talk what, about the, the parts of the model that we actually can use to predict something, and especially the droughts. And here, I'm just putting uh, uh, the tower period in the end here for the last few day, years. And compared with the, what's observed in the meteorological stations in these two, uh, nearby these two sites, and we see that the tower period doesn't have that much of variability, but especially in Santarém, we see lots of variability before, it's including some very severe droughts in the early 90s and in the 80s as well. And here I'm just uh, showing the same uh, plot, but instead of uh, looking at the time series, I'm putting the maximum climatological water deficit and the x-axis, and the, the white box uh, is uh, what some uh, studies before showed as a very likely threshold towards more savanna type of ecosystem, in which you have very uh, strong seasonality of rain and low rain, uh, total rainfall not being too high. And we see that in several years, the, uh, in Santarém, it actually crossed uh, the threshold well into the savanna region, and we start asking ourselves, well, if this kind of years uh, become more common, what would happen with the forest? And here I'm just showing what we did for, to design this, and the, the, the left panel is really uh, a mess, but because it's the, the way we're sampling. But, so what we did for 40 years of run uh, of data, we uh, found some basic statistics, just on the skew normal distribution of rain, yearly annual rainfall for the site. And we start changing the distribution of rainfall uh, by resampling again to create the new scenarios and using uh, this lower location parameters, which are more or less similar to the, the average rainfall. So we see here in the, the box plot in the right that as we, we give more probability of picking up dry years, the median in the end is going to be a lot lower. 
And we run these models. Uh, we did the same thing for Pahaku as well. And we did these uh, simulations, starting with the biomass that is uh, observed in the site and run for 50 years. And uh, for the remaining of the talk, I'm just going to show uh, the average for the last 10 years across all the realizations. And we also set up the model in two different ways. One, the evergreen, in which it's completely not drought adapted, so it doesn't uh, try to store carbon when the situation gets bad. And the other one is the drought deciduous, which would, uh, if the soil moisture becomes very low, they will start uh, shedding the leaves and stop trying any type of growth. And here, uh, it's just a way to, to, to show how the community is uh, represented in ads. So we see like different trees of different sizes and exactly uh, proportional to the amount of population that is in the site. And after 50 years of run using the actual climate, in Pahaku we get a forest, which is good because there is a forest there uh, in, in reality. But when we go to the very dry scenario, one standard deviation, similar, uh, less rainfall on average, we pretty much get the same thing. Uh, it doesn't seem that the forest uh, as a whole seem, uh, is uh, significantly affected. And the reason for that is because the rainfall uh, during the wet season is so ridiculously large in the, the place that even with, uh, if you pick up the driest years, it's still enough rain to, to fill up the, the soil for the next dry season. In Santarém, on the other hand, uh, uh, well, when we run with the actual climate, good thing, uh, we also get a forest because which is good because there is a forest there. But when we run uh, with one standard deviation less uh, uh, rainfall on average, uh, things start to change quite rather dramatically there. And in the evergreen case, we see that pretty much all the, uh, er well, the early succession went extinct. And uh, the, the, uh, among the largest, uh, largest trees, there is just a little bit of uh, late successional trees that are still hanging around and overall, significant loss of biomass. And with the, the drought deciduous, uh, it's not as dramatic, but it's still, we see the same, the same kind of story, less uh, of the large trees, and uh, overall less biomass. And here, uh, I'm just showing, because we did, for each climate scenario, we did some multiple realizations, and that's how the biomass uh, looks like in the end. And we don't see any type of uh, response to drier climates in at Pohaku, and in Santarém, even small changes in climate are enough to reduce the total biomass. And in fact, for the evergreen case, even without changing the, the location parameter, depending on the simulation, we get much less biomass, and that happens just because the, the sampling get, just happens to get multiple uh, uh, years that are uh, extremely dry. And as I said at the beginning, there were just two ways to kill trees in Ed as uh, of now. So it's the, the density independent that is constant and the negative carbon balance. And that's exactly what's killing the, killing the trees, no surprise. And he, uh, at the top panel, uh, I'm just showing all the simulations together. I just lumped them uh, in the same plot. And for June and August, which is just at the beginning of the dry season, I'm just plotting the, uh, the average uh, storage biomass and comparing that with the negative carbon balance. And we see that when the storage is already low, as a result of multiple dry years that they cannot uh, recover the storage pool, uh, the mortality rates tend to be a lot higher. And the same thing is uh, shown in the bottom panel. And if the carbon balance for the previous year is very low, you tend to get higher mortality, just because uh, that's how we are uh, calculating mortality rates in the model. And I, I mentioned briefly before, and just going, uh, coming back to this, is uh, the fact that the mortality did not kill all the trees the same way. And here on the left, bottom left panel, we see the, uh, the distribution uh, of uh, above ground biomass for each DBH class, so small trees, uh, medium sized trees, and large trees, and with the colors in the, the, in the bottom showing the, the scenario. And we see that the biomass uh, is declining in all uh, size classes, but even more so for early successionals that went extinct. In the drought deciduous case, the, the dynamics is a little bit different. Uh, the reduction in biomass is not as severe. And actually, among the smallest class of trees, the, the biomass variation is very small. And for the mid-successional, for example, it's actually increased compared to the to the uh, no change uh, in rainfall distribution. And 
uh, why, uh, and just to give a brief explanation why it, it was happening in the model. Uh, so at the bottom left panel, uh, I'm just showing the average uh, transpiration rates that we get uh, per individual for all the different uh, size classes. And we see that the small trees in general, they have very low transpiration because they, uh, they tend to have lo uh, less leaf area index, so they transpire less. Uh, compared to the, the large trees. But when we aggregate the entire co community, we see that the small trees actually transpire a significant fraction in this, uh, in this forest in Santarém. And, and that is going to affect the, draw, uh, the large trees as well, because they are competing for the same amount of water. And if that water is gone, uh, the, the large trees, they have much higher demands for, uh, for water because they transpire a lot more. And they tend to, to try to, to, to reduce their, their loss. They, they start closing this tomato, which is shown in the top uh, right panel. And uh, this reduction may be so severe that they are no longer able to uptake all the carbon that they need. And as a result, they died. So uh, just to summarize uh, the conclusions that we obtained with this ad t simulations is that uh, the Eastern Amazon response to changes in climate are very likely to be very different depending on the region. In Santarém, for example, which is a very dry site, even minor changes in, uh, in rainfall could result in significant biomass loss. But in Pahaku, because the rainfall is still so large, the, the amount of climate change would have to go beyond what, anything that we tested in the simulations. So, which seems that for a climate, uh, for any significant change, the climate would have to be just dramatically different with that. I'm just uh, going to. Thank you again for listening. Plenty of time for questions. I have one. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't see actually because of the lights. <laughs> Yeah. Did you check that? Did you like uh, that? I did check that for the two sites. Actually, the evaporation in general is, agrees quite well with the observations. Sensible heat sometimes it tends to be uh, overestimated, especially in Santarém, not as much in Pahaku. Uh, but the, for the evaporation, it's actually agreeing quite well with the observations, at least within the uncertainty. Yeah. So, sorry, I think there is another question on the other side. Yeah. I do not. In this, so I mean, in this kind of study, I was just trying to to, to understand uh, the impact in terms of uh, ability to uptake enough carbon. Of course, if you include fire, the story is going to change uh, because uh, this is a different type of disturbance that would probably uh, start creating biomass loss much earlier than what we observe. For example, maybe in Pahaku it would be enough to start seeing some significant decline in biomass. But we don't, uh, at this uh, stage, we don't solve uh, fires at all in the model. So. All right, well, we actually have about 10 more minutes. We have a withdrawn talk. And so though we're a little bit over, we actually have 10 more minutes, and then we'll conclude with uh, Laura Cotine's talk. So what I would say is I think uh, Scott Getz and Scott Mackay are still both here, and we kind of ran out of time for questions, um, especially for uh, Scott Getz didn't get to answer any questions. So if anyone has a question, um, if that's okay with you, Scott, <laughs> um, if we could, we could open up the floor to about five minutes of questions, comments, and, and then move on to the last talk. Okay, one in the back. <laughs> 
I believe the question was, what's the, the basis for the, the non-structural carbon transport? Is that the, the basic idea? Right, well, the non-structural non carbon obviously is transported um, through the phloem transport. Phloem transport has, has been shown by both data and a number of models to be um, about 95% uh, related to the amount of water available in uh, xylem. And so uh, xylem hydraulic conductance and phloem hydraulic conductance will therefore uh, be strongly correlated. Uh, if it can't move water, it can't move, if it doesn't have any water, it can't move the non-structural carbon from, from the leaves to the roots. It gets, it gets stopped somewhere. Right, but the data shows that photosynthesis doesn't decline until we get extremely, it declines somewhat, but it's still somewhat active, even at very low hydraulic conductance. It takes very, very low uh, hydraulic conductances to completely shut down the photosynthesis. Well, two parts to that. One is that, uh, yes, we, could, we can ca account for uh, capacitance in the model. Uh, in this case, we're dealing with uh, systems where we don't really see a lot of evidence of that, so we're not turning that function on. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the sap flux data, which I was showing, uh, shows dr dr dramatic decline in an actual transpiration rates. In fact, the transpiration rates are much higher than you would predict just from changes in uh, active uh, uh, sapwood area. So we have observations of sapwood area change over time, and they decline at a lower rate than the actual transpiration. So the transpiration rate on a tr an intrinsic basis is going down very rapidly. Else out there? We have time for one more question anyway, if anyone has a burning question. No? Okay. Yeah. We'll go ahead. We're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but we'll go ahead and move on to the, the last talk in um, this, this first oral session. Uh, it's Lori Cotine, and she'll talk to us about uh, invasive species and their effects on uh, ecosystem biophysical properties. Um, thank you to the conveners for having me here, and uh, I'd also like to thank my collaborators slash advisors, um, John Hart and Dennis Baldocki. <clears throat> and the title of my talk is Species Invasion in California Ecosystems, Linking Changes in Plant Composition to Changes in Ecosystem Biophysics. <clears throat> 
Um, so my research follows a dramatic shift in California grassland species from native grasses like the bunch grasses that you see on the left to uh, non-native grasses like the ones that you see on the right. And the objective of my study was to understand how this shift has affected biophysical interactions between the land surface and the atmosphere, uh, thus affecting the climate of the lower atmosphere. And more specifically, my objective was to determine how differences in energy partitioning between native perennial and non-native annual grass communities um, were affected, and also to determine how, the, uh, how, um, how this shift caused differences in albedo between native perennial and non-native annual grass communities. Hmm. So um, some background in this case, uh, the disturbance in the context of this session is species invasion. And I'm looking at species invasion as a category of land use and land cover change and as a cause of changes in climate. Um, and to give a little background on the invasion of non-native annual grasses, um, these grasses came from Mediterranean Europe into California. So as I said, there's been a dramatic shift in grassland species. Well, how dramatic? Well, in fact, quite dramatic. Um, uh, Native perennial grasses were once ubiquitous uh, along the coastline um, and throughout the fog belt in California and beyond. Um, and now um, approximately 95% of these grasses have been displaced. And yet they were once uh, so ubiquitous and so kind of emblematic of California that perennial grasses or bunch grasses appear on California state flag. And as you'll see, they also appear right alongside the grizzly bear, which is um, likewise extinct in California. So as I said, the shift has been dramatic. Um, and there are key characteristics that differ between native and non-native grass communities um, that have led us to hypothesize that they may cause a dip changes or a shift in the surface energy balance and also changes in albedo. And one of those changes, um, as you can see from the picture, is differences in above ground plant morphology. Um, uh, as you see, the perennial grasses, the native grasses on the left, are bunchy and they um, form kind of a flat, flatter surface. They present a flatter surface. Um, and the grasses on the right, the non native grasses, are much taller and, and uh, more evenly distributed and sparser. And actually, each of these grass types are associated with a suite of traits um, that led us to hypothesize that there may be differences in the surface energy balance between them and also in albedo. Um, and these traits are related to their, um, their overall life cycle strategy. So the strategy um, for the native grasses, because they're perennial, is to try and survive the extreme summer drought and that occurs each year in California. Actually, there is a drought in California uh, from approximately May to through October each year. And so the bottleneck for these species is to try and survive through this, this period. And because they're perennial, they must um, devise a number of strategies to conserve water. Um, in contrast, the annual species um, essentially survive uh, the summer drought by avoiding it. Um, they grow from seed each year. Uh, uh, they set seed when rains come in November, and they die with the onset of summer drought. So, so, to, so like I said, there are differences in above ground morphology, and these reflect the need to conserve water. So in the native grasses, they are dense and bunchy, and they um, provide a dense cover uh, for the soil surface, preventing or reducing um, evapor uh, soil evaporation, um, whereas the sparser non-native grasses um, allow uh, quite a bit of evaporation from the soil surface to occur. And additional traits um, associated with these grasses, as you can see from this cartoon, um, are differences in rooting depth and also in root shoot uh, allocation. So the perennial grasses, uh, the native grasses on the left, you can see they have much deeper roots and they also allocate more biomass to roots compared to the non-native grasses. Um, their deep roots allow them to exploit the full soil profile for soil moisture. Um, in contrast, 
the annual grasses, the non-native grasses, they concentrate their root system in the top 10 centimeters of soil, top 10 to 20 centimeters of soil, um, and allow that, that those uh, top soil layers to become quite dry. And as I've indicated, um, they also have differences in, in longevity. So um, as I've said, the native grasses are largely uh, perennial, and the non-native grasses, at least in my study, um, are largely annual. And the point I want to make with this slide is that um, because the native grasses are perennial, um, throughout the year and into the summer, there is always a kind of a conduit uh, in the form of the plant pulling soil moisture from the soil to the atmosphere, allowing transpiration to occur. In contrast, in the non-native grasses, they're dead. So that, that uh, conduit is severed between the soil and the atmosphere in the non-native case. OK, so this is my study area um, in California along the coast in Marin, southern Marin County within the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And this region uh, is in the foothills uh, over Tennessee Valley. And here is a schematic of my study site. Um, the orange circles represent the locations of the micrometeorological sensors. Um, <clears throat> and on the upper left, you have the, the native uh, uh, micromet station. And on the lower right, you have the annual uh, non-native annual grass station. And these are collections of sensors uh, measuring a number of environmental variables. And then I've also, um, in this picture up here in the middle, this was a companion study that I completed where I looked at differences between the native grasses and the non-native grasses in terms of carbon cycling and storage. And um, I left this, this up there to point you to um, a paper that was published last year on that study. And um, also to point, to point you to you that I studied two different types of, of native grasses. Um, one was Fustuca rubra and the second Agrostis holly. The one uh, for the energy balance study was Fustuca, was Fustuca rubra. Um, uh, but both appear in some of, in some of the graphs. Okay. And here is a, here's just a photo of what the setup looked like um, in the native grassland. Um, number of sensors, uh, of sensors there. It's a really beautiful site. Um, and just a quick review of, of the components of the surface energy balance and why they're important to climate. Okay, so you have radiation that comes from the sun. Of that radiation, a certain uh, portion is reflected, and that's known as albedo. Um, of the radiation that is absorbed by the ecosystem, some is, is lost to the ecosystem as latent heat flux or evapotranspiration. Some is lost as sensible heat flux. Um, and uh, a smaller portion is lost as ground heat flux, and then another portion as long wave radiant heat. So why is this important? So um, differences in albedo are important because albedo influences the amount of energy that is captured by the ecosystem that is in available to drive surface processes and is also available for heating. Um, and partitioning between latent and sensible heat flux is important. Um, heat that is lost through evapotranspiration tends to transport heat away from the land surface um, and, and has a cooling effect. In contrast, heat, heat that is lost uh, through sensible heat flux um, is transfer that occurs through conduction and convection, and this tends to heat the lower atmosphere or the land surface. So the method that I use, most commonly uh, the eddy covariance method is used. I, in turn, used uh, the surface renewal method, although I calibrated my, my, uh, my surface renewal data with the eddy covariance method. And this is a, this is a low cost alternative to the uh, eddy covariance method, but um, nonetheless provides quite good results. Um, this method uh, relies on the calculation of sensible heat from uh, the use of uh, very fine, wine, fine, fine wire thermocouples um, and relies on this equation. Um, a very simple equation. And the idea is that um, the plant canopy, in the plant canopy, canopy there are um, sweeps and ejections of, of air and, uh, that are associated with turbulent eddies. And the rate at which uh, those air parcels are heated 
or cooled, depending on the stability conditions, um, is related to the sensible heat flux. And it's a, quite a simple calculation, and it, like I said, it works quite well. And then you um, gain the other components of the, the surface energy balance. We measure net radiation and ground heat flux, and um, the difference is the latent heat flux component. So um, moving on to my results, uh, before I show you my results in terms of uh, differences in albedo, I'll just show you how different um, the land surface looks in each ecosystem type uh, at different portions of the year. As you can see, again, we have the native grasses on the left. They're bunchy, um, and they have a surface that kind of covers the ground surface completely, preventing evaporation on the right. The uh, non-native non grasses are more sparse. And here's a view from above. You can see there are many more voids in the non-native grasses where um, photons could get potentially trapped. And the results um, over the course of the year are presented here. Um, I have monthly data. And you can see in, um, this is actually just for uh, the noontime hour, the hottest hour of the day. Um, and you can see that in all cases, the, the native grasses actually had a higher albedo than the non-native grasses, which would lead to potentially a cooler surface. And moving on to talk about energy balance considerations. So as I said, um, the native grasses, they, they cover the ground surface uh, and to, in an attempt to prevent uh, loss of soil moisture. And if you look, um, over the course of this time period, uh, you can see the, so the exotic or non-native grasses are in green, and in the top 20 centimeters of soil, the uh, soil moisture is, is lower throughout this time series. Um, in contrast, the Festuca, again, that's where um, the micrometeorological sensors were set up, that is the native grass, and that is, it is wetter. It is wetter at the top of the soil surface there. Um, and I should point out that this is, um, this is work I've recently revisited, and the, and the measurement period was 2005 through 7. And you also can see that the soil temperature is affected by um, these differences in life cycle strategy. And the exotic or non-native grasses are um, warmer uh, in the top five centimeters of soil than the native grasses. Um, and that, that difference is, uh, is most extreme um, in the summer season uh, during the hottest conditions as well. And so what did I find? Um, so here you can see weekly means of sensible heat flux for the year 2005. Um, uh, and uh, this is um, sensible heat flux on the left and latent heat flux on the right. Um, I think the, the one thing I'll point out is that um, mm. In the, in the summer, I don't know if this is going to black that, push hard. OK, that's OK. You can see um, on the latent heat flux in the graph on the right that uh, the, the latent heat flux is higher where the native perennial grasses are found in this year. And let me point out that this year was um, a wetter than average year. Um, rainfall is highly variable on an interannual basis in California. This was a wetter than average year, and it also had an extended rainy season. So um, I might have expect expected the soils to um, be somewhat even between the two, two grass types. But then if I look at the annual sums, I see that the differences in sensible heat flux are actually quite small. Um, but there is, a, um, there is a substantial difference, or there is a small difference, at least, between um, grass types in terms of, of evapotranspiration or, or latent heat flux. Um, moving on to subsequent years, um, I can see in 2006, now this was a, also a wetter than average year, but the rain was concentrated uh, predominantly in the winter season. Um, I see that there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, in uh, energy partitioning between the two grass types. But again, there is a small difference um, in latent heat flux between the native and non-native grasses in this, in this year. And the last year I looked at was, was 2007. And um, I think in this year that you can see that the sensible heat flux, it, it, particularly in the summer season, is higher in the non-native grasses. 
um, and the native grasses, uh, the latent heat flux is higher. And the annual sums um, actually show uh, um, more of a difference in this year. And this was the, the driest year, um, which is interesting. So those are essentially my conclusions. Um, and um, overall, what I'd say is that uh, annual grass invasion has caused a shift in energy partitioning towards sensible heat flux, particularly in the drier years, and lowered surface albedo, probably raising surface temperatures, particularly during hot summer months. And my next steps are to complete um, error analysis and also models. Uh, uh, I have a small scale model that will help me look specifically how these changes affect surface temperature. And I'd just like to thank my, my sponsors, and thank you. Questions? Yes. One more time, please. Um, well, I mean, albedo, albedo can change it changes uh, net energy capture of, of the ecosystem. So the, the, it, it, it affects the amount of heat that is available to heat the surface, essentially. So I found, because I said I did, I did also, um, I also did a companion study where I looked at the carbon cycle differences. I don't think that the albedo differences are actually strong enough to affect the carbon balance. I think that there are other differences that are that override that albedo difference in this case. Yeah. Um, just from a simple energy balance uh, analysis, if the sensible heat flux is the same, the latent heat flux is higher in the native grass, that would imply that the net radiation is higher in the native grass. I, I did find that it was a little bit higher in the native grass. I also I also point out that um, within error, I think it's these values are mostly within error. Maybe not not the last year. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I did find that the noonday. Um, albedo was higher in the native grass, but I found that net radiation overall was slightly higher, net radiation, in, uh, year round in the um, native grass type. Annual sums. Annual sums for grass. Right. Yes. But then the, net the net radiation was slightly higher in the, in the native grasses. Net radiation capture was higher in the native grasses. Yeah. Slightly. Yeah. Um, the albedo in this case was, was par albedo. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank all the speakers uh, who did a fantastic job presenting in this first session. We will um, we'll head out a little bit earlier than maybe our peers and, and grab a beer and or um, coffee and reconvene here at 4 o'clock for the, the second session. Thank you.